He's a two-time college football national champion. He won the Heisman Trophy in 2007 while playing for the University of Florida. He's also been a first-round NFL draft pick, ESPN contributor, a former professional baseball player. What hasn't he done? Well, five-time New York Times bestseller books. Uh, and he joins us tonight with an inspirational new book, Mission Possible, One Year Devotional. Please welcome Tim Tebow to the program. Tim, thanks for being here. In a recent Instagram post, you admit to being a people pleaser and that you had to change your mindset from pleasing people to earning their respect to grow yeah. closer to God and bring others closer to him. And you attribute this quote by Winston Churchill with helping you see the need for change. If you have enemies, good. It means you stood for something at least once in your life. How did that quote change you and how you go about bringing others closer to God? Wow, Raymond, that's a, a good question. You did some research in your homework. So um, I, I, by you nature, bet. I am such a people pleaser, man. I, I wanted to, I want to be friends. I would want people to like me. I still want people to like me. It's my nature. I, I'm just not someone that um, easily, I, I'm not bold like my dad is naturally. And so I, I just especially remember mm -hmm. getting to college and on that kind of next level, that platform of, of scrutiny and um, and fame somewhat, but just you have all these people, and I just remember getting scrutinized on another level, and I just remember going home and saying to Dad, like, Dad, man, if if they if these people would get to know me, Dad, I think they would like hmm. me, and and I just remember my dad looks at me and he said, Timmy, they probably would if they really got to know you because you are likable, but unfortunately, hmm. Timmy, some people. They won't even want to take the time to get to know you, and they don't want to actually like you. And it was at a time when I was also mm -hmm. reading uh, about Winston Churchill, and that's where I, I, I saw that quote, and I was impacted by it yeah. because I was thinking, how in the world, Raymond, could it be good to have enemies? Like, do, don't we want to try to be friends with everyone? And And it was kind of understanding the difference between being friends, being friendly, being liked versus being mm -hmm. respected. And what I would come to kind of understand about Winston Churchill is because he stood for something, a lot of people didn't like him because they couldn't see what he saw. They didn't believe what he believed. And even the Allies thought he was going to lose the war for the Allies. And if you're on the other side, you hated him because he was your enemy. But right. but they didn't understand it. But one day they came to respect him for it. And now we, we talk about Winston Churchill and, and most people are like, wow, you know, it's incredible what he's done, what he stood for, all of his writings, all his beliefs. And, and it was because he was willing to stand for something when a lot of other people um, weren't willing to. I was also, um, you know, in that time studying the scriptures and reading John 16, 33, which is one of my favorite verses. And it's Jesus talking to his disciples the night before he goes to the cross. And he looks at them. And he says, for in me, you have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome mm -hmm. the world. And, and it was something that was really impactful to me at that same time. It was saying, oh my gosh, like really what I was looking for was peace in relationships because I'm a people pleaser when I need to be looking for peace in my relationship with Christ and that I will have trial and tribulations. And that doesn't mean we're not trying to be friends or friendly and, and love everyone. It just means that's not right. where we find our peace. We find it in him. And, um, and, and that was a big transition for me of, of still trying to love people, but more so instead of trying to earn likes, it was earn respect. Tim, you were born in the Philippines to missionary parents. How did they inspire you to want to share your faith? Because they're my biggest role models. Um, my mom being someone who is very rarely ever growing up that I hear her say a bad word about anyone. And she would always tell us um, what is desirable in a man is his kindness. Um, going back to scripture and then and uh, she would sing to us and sing verses to us. And that just made a massive impact. And my dad probably being my greatest hero because not what he he said to us, but what he showed us in his life of 
giving the majority mm-hmm. of his adult life to helping people that could never help him and and never do anything for him. And then his courage and his conviction and his urgency to do it, to get to as many hurting people, to help as many people as possible, to take the hard steps, to to be able to go places very few would go, to um, you know, be able to um, you know, it's how we, it's how I got involved also in the, the fight against human trafficking is to be able to, you know, my, my dad in an underground pastor's conference in remote country bought four girls that were being auctioned off to be able to, to buy them, to set them free, right? Like that's the, mm. the hero that my dad has been to me. And to be able to see that, that yes. love isn't just a feeling and it's not just, a, um, uh, it's not just, you know, these butterflies we get, but the greatest form of love is a choice to choose the best interest of another person and act on their behalf. It's what Jesus did for us. It's what I've seen my dad do for so many people. It's what too many times I've failed at, but I want to get better, that I want to choose people's best interests and act on their behalf. And that's why he's my hero. Tim, you attribute your life's purpose to when you were a 15-year-old boy in the jungle of the Philippines. And tell me what happened, who you met there that changed your life. I met a young boy named Sherwin who was born with his feet on backwards. And because he was born that way, his village viewed him as cursed, as less than, as insignificant. Mm. And he was treated as a throwaway. Um, But I fell in love with that boy, and I knew... um, that he wasn't a throwaway to God. And I so felt on my heart that God was pricking my heart to say, he better not be a throwaway to you, Timmy, because he's not a throwaway to me. And I knew that day that I love sports. I love competing. I love trying to be the best I could be. But it's not what I was supposed to do with my life. What I was supposed to do with my life was to fight for boys and girls around the world Mm -hmm. like him that are being viewed as less than because they're not to God. And I know that they better not be to me. And there are so many people Mm -hmm. around the world that still to this day, as we are having this conversation, still viewed as less than, as insignificant. And there are throwaways. And we have to do a better job of getting to every single one of them because they have great worth. They have great value to God and they better have it to us. Tim, in 2010, you created the Tim Tebow Foundation, which uh, focuses on really the several ministries, people with special needs, orphan care, uh, children with profound medical needs, human trafficking victims, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, you're about to build a camp for children in the Poconos, 3,000 acres of land. What inspired you to start the foundation, and, and where is it now? Where do you see it going? Well, the the foundation was really inspired by that boy in the Philippines. And when I graduated from Florida, Mm -hmm. it's one of the first things we did. Um, And I wrote the mission statement to bring faith, hope, and love to those needing a brighter day in their darkest hour of need. And I wrote that literally just thinking about Sherwin, where he was in his life and what he needed, is he was in the darkest hour of need, and he needed people to love him enough to bring faith, hope, and love to him, to his situation. And that is our heart. That is our heart's cry to get as many places Mm -hmm. as we can around the world. We're so grateful that God has opened doors for us to now be in over 70 countries around the world. Um, But we have to get farther into all those countries, into more countries to get to every single hurting person. And and what you're referring to with with Rising Light Ridge is the the camp in the Poconos that we have um, already serving kids, but we're still, we broke ground and we're building the camp out. But while we're building it, we're still serving in the meantime. And and really that camp is called Rising Light Ridge. And it is a place where we want everybody to find belonging. We want everybody to be loved, to be served, to be cared for, to know their worth and their value. That's why we call it a place of belongings, because everybody belongs in the family of God. And we want to be able to share that. And we want people to know that. And, mm. and we want to be able to serve people with special needs. We want to be able to serve people who haven't had the chances before. We want to be able to serve people um who, who come from um, from harder areas, from don't have as many opportunities. We want to be able to serve people who have been in one of the greatest evils in the world and, and, um, and, and trapped in that the terrible place of human trafficking. We want to be able to serve all these people. So um, that is our heart. Uh, the, the land was was given to us, and now it is it, it is our heart to be able to give it to those that, that are hurting so that they can find joy, they can find hope, they can mm. find peace, and they can find restoration. 
Tim, before we run out of time, I have to get to your new book, uh, Mission Possible, One Year Devotional. Uh, in a recent video you posted on social media, you ask people if they're committed to reading the Bible as they are to drinking a cup of coffee each morning. And you point out that it takes just that time, the time it takes to brew a coffee, you could read several reflections in your book. What do you find are the biggest obstacles keeping people from making that commitment each day? I think it's our mindset. I think it's the consistency. I think it's all the things that are thrown at us every day. I mean, Raymond, let's just be honest. How many Mondays have I woke up in my life and I've got caught up in all the different things that have been thrown at me, the busyness of life, the um, the clutter of life, the things I feel like I got to get to. And um, you, even though I'm someone that... I, I've, I've been taught the truth and I know it. I still let things get in the way. And so it's encouraging people. Mm. Let's not let things get in the way. Let's start with the, a mission mindset. Let's get into God's word. And that's why every day we start with, um, with portions of scripture and then we try to make it practical. And then we try to encourage them a along the way. Um, but, but just for two to five minutes, if we could just start our day, you know, in God's word and then also with encouraging stories, well, we can frame our mindset to be prepared for that day because in that day, we can get caught up in so many distractions, and that's been true in my life so many days. I've just been caught up with all the things I have to do rather than starting it with the right framework, with the right mindset in God's Word, with the right encouragement, and the right challenges as well. Is that something we also want to challenge people, you know, to, to get uncomfortable, to give a little a little bit more, to care a little bit more, to pray a little bit more, to serve a little bit more. And then we also really, really, really want to encourage people because Raymond, we all know this life can be hard. It can have disappointments. It can have pain. It can have frustrations. And so we want to be able to encourage people. You know what encouragement, mean, or encouragement means? It means to give support, confidence, or hope to. And when people pick this up, mm. I, I hope and I pray that they, they feel supported in God's word and God's promises and yeah. God's love for them. I, I hope that they have hope and, and, and I hope that they have confidence mm. in, in, in who they were created to be and how much God loves them and how he has a special, special plan and purpose Thank for their you. life. And Tim, we should tell people uh, th there's usually a Bible quote, uh, a reflection. And of course, then it's some of your insights, sometimes using sports analogies or things that happened in your life. And then usually a series of questions to kind of jumpstart the day. Why did you decide to, to use that form to create this well, devotion? Because I think it's a lot of different ways that we can learn from and be impacted. I think sometimes um, when we give people thoughts on reflections, um, first of all, it's always important to start with Scripture because that's God's Word. It's His promises. It's His love letter to mm -hmm. us, and it's always the right place to start. And then, you know, coming up with some different thought-provoking questions. And and I even, um, in 31 of these devotionals, um, they're, they're written by other people that are heroes of mine, that some of them are parents who have lost their children to— to diseases. Mm. Some of them are kids with life-threatening illnesses. One of them is a survivor of human trafficking, and I wanted the world to be able to hear some of their story because I also think that, that they're just inspirations to me, and I think they'll be inspirations to so many people, but it's also how in those tough situations, how God has used their pain um, to turn it into purpose and how God has used their pain because they've given it to Him to, to use it for good and how all of us have gone through hard times, but, but our God is a big God that is also sovereign that can use all of those things um, together um, for good to those that love him. Okay, Tim, I've saved the most difficult question for last. You titled this devotional after your book, Mission Possible, which was about creating a life that counts. Um, tell us, before we run out of time, how do you discern what God is calling you and what your mission in life is? How does one figure that out? That's really good. Well, first, I think it starts by knowing that you have one, knowing that you were created on purpose for a purpose. It's understanding that God of this universe really does have a purpose for all of us. What does even purpose mean? The reason we were created, the reason we exist. You could also say mission, a task or a job someone has been given to do. That's why we titled it Mission Possible. What is possible means? It means to be able. And I believe every single one of us has a purpose and a mission, and we are able to accomplish it. How do we know that? What? How, how do we know what it is? Well, I think in the macro, we all have the same. And it's to love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But in the micro, I think we all have different ones. How do we live that out? Well, that's really hard. You're going to see a lot of different people talk about it to try to figure out, try to understand it. 
But I want to encourage people to look at it this way. What have your eyes been open to and what has your heart been pricked for? And in in those moments in your life, we talked about when I had the chance to meet Sherwin, right? That day, my eyes were Mm -hmm. open to something I hadn't seen and my heart was pricked to do something about it. When we have those moments, when we have those chances, let's step into it. Even if we get uncomfortable, even if we're not sure, even if we don't have all the answers, that's okay. Let's dive into it because even whether that is your, your, your in purpose or not, I also believe that it can help lead you to wherever we're supposed to go next. But I would also encourage people, you know, God can do anything that he wants. But I don't usually see a lot of people that their life's getting impacted just by watching, you know, two, three, four seasons of the latest Netflix shows or just scrolling. (laughs) And so why God can use that to impact people, I don't see it a lot. But I do see when people are willing to step outside of their comfort zone a little bit, and to, to care, to serve, to help in places, how he can use that so much in our life to to grow us, to let us see the next thing we're supposed to do. And he can use Netflix, but man, I don't know that I, I see him doing that with a lot of people. And, you know, maybe if we just put that down a little bit, and, and I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's fun for me and my wife to watch our favorite show, but every now and then we just need to put it down and see, okay, hey, maybe what's the next greatest way we can go serve? Well, I I love that you're encouraging people to be spiritually watchful. You know, I I just wrote a book on the wise men, and they were watching. They were looking beyond their earthly experience to something else and then to act on that. And that's really what this devotional is about. Mission Possible, one-year devotional, 365 days of inspiration for pursuing your God-given purpose by Tim Tebow is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Tim, thank you so much for being here. We'll do this in person sometime soon. I love it. Raymond, thanks for all the the research and the questions. Man, you did your homework. I love it. That was fun, man. Well, thank my producer, too. We try to, we try to respect our guests enough to raise the bar. So thank you, Tim. I love it. Appreciate you, man. Thank you.